So, so really, it's just to make sure that everybody is on the same page and agrees that research is important. Um, it drives um, improvements in patient care. And just to remind people that this COVID pandemic that we've just been through, uh, one of the reasons that we, we got out of it was through the vaccine program. And that was the consequence of a series of large-scale trials that were rolled out very quickly. The UK played a major part in um, the, the international uh, program of, of, of vaccine research. And, uh, you know, and, and it was you know, thanks to that that actually we've saved a lot of lives and, and moved out into hopefully some degree of normality. So in the same vein, um, on the right-hand side, you can see um, a series of pretty colored lines. And for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, you will see some of these curves. They're called survival curves. And OS is overall survival. And you can see on the, the left-hand side, 100% of people start at being alive. And the, as you move across the, um, sorry, <laughs> when they start in a clinical trial, and this is, you know, we're going to be very frank and open about this. This is patients with metastatic melanoma. If you follow the dotted line, you'll see that that ends down on the bottom, which means that over time, most people historically, when I started treating metastatic, metastatic melanoma patients, very few of them, it's a small clinic because people died very quickly within a year or two of their diagnosis. But what you can see is those curves are beginning to rise up. And each one of those curves represents a group of patients who've entered a clinical trial and have been treated with one of the new treatments that we're now using routinely in clinic. And some people, I was just talking um, to somebody who's receiving this kind of treatment at the moment. Um, and so these clinical trials have made a difference in my lifetime over the last um, 20 years of being a consultant. Um, and it's been a huge privilege to see that change. Um, so we haven't stopped. We've got lots more work to do, and we're going to talk a little bit about that now. So what is the problem? Here's a melanoma, and most people will have surgery, and most people will be cured by their surgery. But about 20% of people will have recurrence, and that can spread to places that the surgeons can get to or places that the surgeons can't get to. Um, and that's when we need to come in and try and find non-surgical treatments and, and drug treatments. And we tend to test our treatments initially in people with advanced disease. Um, and we call this um, stage four disease, and the treatment is palliative, generally in terms of trying to prolong life and improve quality of life. And that's where we started some 20 odd years ago. Um, and once we've found the treatments work, what we then tend to do is we tend to um, test those drugs earlier on in the patient pathway. Um, so, for example, here, a patient who's had their resected regional nodal disease may be offered treatment to try and reduce the risk of that coming back, and we call that adjuvant therapy. So we do trials of adjuvant therapy. We might put those drugs up front before their surgery, and we call that neoadjuvant, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And we might, if we're getting really confident, start using these treatments in people who have primary melanoma but are still at risk of recurrence. Um, so stage one and two disease. And then, of course, ideally, prevention is better than cure. So we have work that goes on in the prevention environment, um, and that's about stopping melanomas happen at all, uh, and speaks to, to Amy's work about really we, we do need to do things there that's really important. So we talk about primary prevention. Um, just to finish this off, that middle bit is about secondary prevention, preventing uh, recurrence. But ideally, our, our holy grail is, can we cure people from this disease? Um, and I'm hopefully going to demonstrate that I think we're making an impact in all these areas. So the two classes of drugs that have revolutionized how we treat this disease, I'm just going to summarize very briefly. This is a cartoon of a T cell. This is the immune cell, which is really important in stimulating and, and generating an immune response. And you can see lots of little um, um, uh, colored things sticking out, and these are called receptors. And various molecules can engage with those receptors and affect the T cell function. And this is our immunotherapy. 
And on the other hand, about 50% of melanomas have a particular pathway in the cell, which is governed by a gene called BRAF. Um, and in, the, in, 50, sorry, in all cells, this, this, this pathway exists, but in about 45% of patients, that gene is mutated. And in those patients, that pathway is pushing their, their cancer growth. And so we can use BRAF-targeted therapy. So we have these two different classes of drugs that we're, we're, we're using in the clinic now. Um, and so where did we start? Here's our T-cell again. And this gentleman here, Jim Allison, um, is, is the scientist who won a Nobel Prize for developing the first treatment called ipilimumab. And ipilimumab is one of those funny little molecules that is going to engage with that sticky out receptor, CTLA-4. And that process actually helps to drive the immune response and takes the brakes off the immune system, puts it into overdrive, gets those T cells looking for the cancer cells to destroy them. And on the bottom right-hand side, you can see that survival curve again. And what's important here is that although there is a fall, fall off, most people sadly are dying, what you see is a plateau. And that plateau is about 20% of people who have long-term survival gain. And that's what we've identified and what's exciting about immunotherapy. And what we're trying to do is push that curve upwards to try and get more people in that survival uh, group. So how have we done that? Well, next to CTLA-4 is another molecule called PD-1. Um, and what we've done is tried to combine drugs um, that block both of these agents. Um, and an important trial now has been running, uh, ran, um, has been running for a long time uh, with patients still in follow-up. Um, and this is the Checkmate 067 trial. Um, and we have patients who are still alive who took part in this trial. Um, and here we're looking at what's called melanoma-specific survival. And what you see is that these curves are all becoming horizontal. So we know that these people who may well actually be um, being cured um, because we're looking specifically at their, their outcome from the melanoma perspective. What you can see is that the bottom curve is patients treated with ipilimumab, that first antibody. The second curve is nivolumab, and the third curve is the combination. You can see each time it's pushing up, although the increment between the, the nevo and the ipinevo is, is relatively modest. Now, importantly, um, and many people who've received these drugs will be aware that some complex side effects can occur with these drugs. They can generate all sorts of inflammation in any, any body system. And some of that can be mild, some of it can be life-threatening um, and certainly life-changing. So you can get colitis, pneumonitis, it can affect your thyroid function, um, all sorts of weird and wonderful things that can make lives uh, pretty miserable for patients um, and affect any body system. So if we go back to that survival curve uh, that we were looking at from that, uh, that particular trial, what's important to notice really is the increment between the nivolumab and the, the ipinevo. There's a very significant upping of the, the grade three and four, the severe and life-threatening toxicity. And this is something that we talk to our patients all the time about, is for that small incremental potential benefit in terms of survival, you have this big risk of, of toxicity. So lots of challenges that, that we have to deal with, and we try and address these through further clinical trials. So there are questions that we need to be addressing. We need to try and improve those survival curves and push them up higher. How much treatment do we need to give? These drugs are licensed until progression, until clinical benefit ends, um, and that can be many years for those patient, patients who are benefiting. Can we actually predict those people who are going to benefit um, or going to run into problems with toxicity so we can personalize therapy? And what happens if they don't work? Um, do we have other options for them? Um, so recently, um, if we go back to that T-cell cartoon, here's another of those sticky out receptor things um, called LAG3. Um, and we've done some work to combine that again with PD-1 to see again whether we can actually improve efficacy um, over the PD-1 um, drug on its own. And the aim is to try and push those T cells to become more and more active to go out and drive and, and, and find those tumor cells and destroy them. So a trial called Relativity was conducted. Um, it's, these are often international trials, um, and the UK um, played a part. Um, and these patients, and when I say UK, these are patients like people in this room. Um, and the, the trial involved randomization to standard of care nivolumab or the combination. 
And you can see here, uh, the blue line represents the combination. And the important thing to take away is that the blue line is above the green line. It's a small difference, but there's definitely an improvement in the chances of that cancer growing. Um, and also in terms of overall survival, again, the blue curve is above the green curve. And in this case, in terms of toxicity, whereas with the Ipinevo, we saw that really high, nearly 60% of severe life-threatening toxicity. Here with the combination, it's not that much more than the Nevo on its own. So that's quite interesting that actually maybe we can get that incremental gain without all that toxicity. And this combination at the moment is being looked at by NICE to see whether or not it will be approved uh, for use in the UK. So how much treatment is actually needed? So we need to be a little bit careful here. I know there's pharma in the room. Um, but there is a certain element, obviously, you know, that the more drug that is, is prescribed, the more uh, pharma generate income. And there is a group called the Optimal Care um, Cancer Care Alliance that is really concerned that there is a degree of overdosing going on. And we see that a lot with, with the trial data. Um, and we really do need to be thinking about what is the optimal dose um, and uh, to get the best outcomes of patients rather than simply going down the line of, of, of um, the pharma-driven, with regard to the respect, um, use of very high-cost drugs for very long durations of time. Um, and so we need to ask these questions. What is the optimal drug dose and what is the optimal treatment duration? And these are trials that industry aren't going to do and they tend to be done by academia. Uh, and in the UK, we ran the Dante trial led by Sarah Danson in Sheffield, where we asked patients who had gone through a year of treatment and were progression-free with metastatic disease, um, whether they would consider being randomized to stop treatment or to continue. Um, and that study has now closed. It will take a number of years for us to follow up those patients. Um, and hopefully we will, we will see what the results will be. So we're trying to ask that question whether actually one year is enough treatment, actually. Meanwhile, the REFINE trial is asking a question about frequency of treatment. And Duncan Gilbert um, in, in London is looking at comparing the standard frequency with reduced frequency of administration of the drug. Um, so you can see that these drugs are usually given either four or six weekly. Well, what if we give them eight or 12 weekly um, and see whether or not we can still get that same benefit to patients? And this is not just plucked out of thin air. There's good pharmacology behind doing this. So we're not trying to risk patients' benefit. Um, and all these trials have uh, what we call data, data and safety, um, safety monitoring committees to make sure that patients don't come to any harm if we're actually de-escalating treatment. Can we personalize treatment and identify those patients most likely to respond or run into problems with toxicity? Well, this is um, some area that we're involved in in Cambridge where we're interested in the microbiome. Um, we know that the gut uh, flora is associated with our immune system and there's increasing data to suggest that, there, that it is involved in the response and toxicity associated with immunotherapy. And in our um, data set uh, in, in, um, uh, in Cambridge collecting um, stool from patients on immunotherapy, we've identified a consortium of nine bacteria that appear to predict for response. Now that's not unique. There are a number of groups that have published in this area, but what is unique is that we can take our bacteria and reanalyze the data that's already out there and have consistently shown that we can actually separate out the responders from the non-responders across all these international data sets, which nobody else has been able to do before. And so we are validating that through a, a, a large-scale study across actually melanoma, renal, and lung cancer patients all receiving standard immunotherapy. And we've been collecting stool from patients um, as they receive their treatment. And we're in the process of, of, of doing an interim analysis to see exactly whether or not that bacterial consortium, that signature, is, is real. Because if it is, could we use those bacteria and give those back to patients alongside their immunotherapy and, and improve their chances of response or even turn a non-responder into a responder. So just to move on to the, the story of BRAF, um, we talked a little bit earlier about the BRAF mutation being present in about 45% of melanomas. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the, the 
the tumours are full of DNA, and some of those DNA fragments actually leach out into the bloodstream. And we now have clever scientists who can actually measure those DNA fragments, and we call this circulating DNA. And you can separate out and see the difference between normal DNA and tumour DNA. So can we actually measure circulating tumour DNA in the clinic and use that to guide how we manage patients? And the group in Manchester, led by Paul Lorigan and Becky Lee, have done a or doing a series of trials using this concept and trying to, to understand the value of, of that ctDNA. So, for example, with um, BRAF um, mutant metastatic melanoma, those patients actually have the opportunity to have either immunotherapy or targeted therapy. Can we use this to actually work out how to, how to schedule that treatment. So could we start a patient on immunotherapy because we believe that may be the right thing to do? Can we follow their ctDNA? And if that drops down, can we then start using um, alternative treatments um, and, or even give them a break of treatment? So the CACTUS trial um, has completed, and then they have another trial um, called the dynamic trial, where in this case, the interest is that the problem with BRAF targeted therapy is that it tends to have a limited duration of benefit because patients become resistant to that treatment. So one of the ways of trying to avoid that resistance is being tested in the dynamic trial where either patients receive continuous BRAF targeted therapy or the patients have regular ctDNA being measured. And if the levels drop, you could actually stop treatment and give them a break. But if it rises again, restart treatment and see whether actually you can keep them on treatment and get more out of that treatment for longer. So I'm just going to move down, into, down earlier into the pathway now and talk about adjuvant therapy. Um, so these are the patients who are at high risk of recurrence after their surgery. Um, and the stage three patients now are routinely offered adjuvant therapy, again through clinical trials that been, have been conducted. And those survival curves, again, hopefully you're getting familiar with what these now look like, confidently show you that both BRAF targeted therapy and immunotherapy are superior to no treatment after um, surgery. So these are routinely now available thanks to these trials and many UK patients participated in them. Um, we are now moving earlier into the pathway and thinking about those stage two patients of which some are at, are at high risk as well of, of recurrence. Here you can see that the curves start much higher i.e. just through their surgery, many more patients will be cured. Um, but there are still many people who will run into problems. And the gap between the curves is quite small. Um, and so that's a tricky one, uh, because although, in theory, that suggests that the treatment is, is, is a good thing for patients, as we talked about earlier, there are a lot of life-changing, life-threatening side effects associated with treatment, and we have to bear that in mind given the fact that we're probably over-treating a lot of people who would be cured anyway by their surgery. So again, the, the Manchester guys, I'm not going to go through this in detail, just to, just to really summarise by saying that, again, trying to use circulating tumour DNA, this time possibly looking at some other mutations, not just BRAF, may enable us to identify those patients who need treatment. If you follow their, their blood samples, and only when that ctDNA starts to rise do you then offer them that adjuvant therapy. And that means that we can avoid giving people treatment that they don't need and try and get the treatment to the people who do need it. And this trial is, is currently um, awaiting approval, and we hope that it will start later this year. So something really hot off the press from the last six months is some work done by the um, Americans to ask the question, we're talking about adjuvant therapy after surgery. Should we be starting it before our surgery? And the reason for that is that the argument would be is, as demonstrated here, if you give the, the immune, immunotherapy at the time when the tumor is still intact and there's lots of T cells in that tumor trying to deal with, with the cancer, will you actually generate a bigger immune response and have a more effective um, chance of killing off the, um, the, the tumor cells and therefore reduce both local and distant metastatic disease? And oops, and so um, the Americans run this trial um, and compared uh, standard adjuvant pembrolizumab immunotherapy to um, a, a schedule where three cycles were given prior to surgery. Um, and these are in resectable stage three, four disease. 
And you can see here, again, this is a very early uh, time point for assessing outcomes for the patients, but you can see, again, a big gap between the patients who had that little bit of treatment, literally just three cycles of their standard adjuvant therapy before their surgery, seem to make a huge difference in terms of uh, the recurrence. Um, and so this has really caught the community by storm and there's a lot of conversations going on internationally right now as to whether there is enough data here to change clinical practice because here the company that makes pembrolizumab is not going to uh, um, request a new license for this but there are no additional uh, drug costs associated but it is a change in clinical practice and logistically might be a bit challenging. So this is something to, um, to, to follow. Um, and then just to mention that there are other neoadjuvant trials going on. This is one trial that I'm leading where we're actually specifically focusing in on the BRAF mutant patients to see whether, again, if we start their BRAF targeted therapy prior to surgery, might we get that same benefit that we've just seen with immunotherapy. And that trial has literally just opened um, uh, this month. So just to change tack, we're not just interested in drugs, and we're coming to the end. Um, we are interested in surgery. Um, so Mark Moncrief is um, a surgeon in, in Norwich, and he's working internationally um, to look at the excision margins of um, after a, a resected after a, a primary tumor is, is being resected. And many of you may have experienced yourself that when patients have, when, once you've had your primary melanoma removed, they then go back and do what is called a wide local excision, and the width of that excision is subject to great debate. And it sounds very trivial, one centimeter versus two centimeter comparison here, but actually that's the whole way around the tumor. So actually you, you double that and some because of the tumor itself. And you can think if you've got a, a melanoma on your face, as Amy had, the resection margins are very important in terms of cosmetic uh, and morbidity issues. Um, so it does matter. There are reconstruction issues, there are complications, there's pain, there's resources and cost to, to working out whether or not one centimeter is just as good as, as two centimeters. Um, and the Melmark II study is, um, is currently uh, recruiting internationally to answer this question. And although the primary endpoint is a clinical one about recurrence of, of, of melanoma, um, it also has lots of patient reported outcomes and quality of life issues as well as health economics. Um, so that will be a really interesting study um, to follow. And um, it's a big study. It needs nearly 3,000 patients. It's recruited over 1,000 um, already. Um, and in the UK, over well, 241 patients um, have been recruited, and I think that's probably a picture of Norwich City or somewhere like that. I'm not a footballing person, but that's um, Mark um, leading the top of the table there in terms of recruitment. And just one more thing just to finish, um, and to mention rare melanomas. Um, uh, Susanna mentioned the work that we're doing there, and although most melanomas arise from the skin, about 5% don't, and most of those that don't arise in the eye, they're generally BRAF wild type. They generally don't respond very well to immunotherapy, and they have a very poor prognosis. That's a picture of a retina, the back of an eye where there's pigment, and this is, a mu this is what we call a mucosal melanoma um, that can occur in the, 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 the kind of skin, we call it a mucosa, that lines the whole of the gut, so it can occur anywhere from the mouth, the nasal passages, right down through the gut to your bottom, um, and also the urogenital passages. So they're really nasty cancers, really. Um, and important, uh, uh, well, importantly, um, it is important. Um, so um, I was involved with Mark Middleton. I'm not sure if he's around yet, but um, um, Mark and, and I were involved with a, a small biotech company at the time based in Oxford who um, had developed this new molecule, um, and it was a modified T-cell receptor um, that was designed to, to link up onto melanoma cells and activate T-cells. Um, and this agent um, was tested and looked like it was particularly useful in ocular melanoma. And this was a trial conducted um, in metastatic ocular melanoma patients where patients received the new drug now, now called Tabentafusp versus investigator choice. Uh, and again, you can see the superiority of the new agent. Um, and that is licensed um, and again is, is out for NICE approval um, decisions. 
So there's a lot of stuff that's going on, a lot of stuff in progress, and all these clinical trials, some of them are still ongoing now, there will be many more, and they all need real people to be prepared to trust their, invest their, their clinical colleagues um, and take part. Um, so you know, we can't do it without our patients, and you know, we're better together. Um, as you heard, there is the Melanoma Trial Finder um, on the website now. And um, these are just shots where you can just work through. I did it myself the other day and, and, and um, just took these shots, popped in MITRE, and here we see the sites, um, and Adam Brooks is where I am based. There's a little bit of information on the, um, the, the chief investigator. It's not going to give you um, an email address or a, or a telephone number of a doctor that you can call yourself. I must stress that this whole idea is that you go back to your specialist and ask them what trials are available for me, um, and they need to do the referring, okay? So it's very much doctor to doctor. But if you're not being offered a clinical trial, always ask that question, is there a trial for me? Because there's really good evidence to suggest that taking part in trials improves your chances. Um, you get high quality care, um, you get state of the art treatment, um, and, and, and hopefully there is an altruistic element, obviously, about improving outcomes for the next generation. And you can see um, how things have evolved so quickly in the last 10 years, thanks to many people who've gone before. Um, and just to mention, the National Cancer Research Institute and the National Institute for Health and Care Research are our national organizations who provide all sorts of information about clinical trials. Um, and um, and you know, the Be Part of Research scheme is not, about, not just about finding trials, it's also about people registering to be prepared to take part in clinical trials. So do have a look at that website as well. And that's my lot. Um, I think there's going to be questions later, so um, I'll probably not take anything now unless anything urgent.